אפשר? אוקיי. So, uh, we continue with our uh, second session for this morning uh, with a presentation of uh, Mr. Moses Kwase Aido. Um, Moses is uh, from uh, Ghana. Uh, he uh, finished his bachelor degree in agricultural technology in the University of uh, Development uh, Study. Uh, and he worked as a, an agricultural extension officer in the Ministry of Food and Agriculture in uh, Ghana. Uh, Moses, please. Thank you, Shuki, and welcome from the break. The topic of my research exercise is catalyzing the effectiveness of chickpea rhizobium isolated from Israeli culture collection. This work was supervised by Professor Alicia Terrell here in the Hebrew University, and then Professor Yoram Kaponi, a researcher from Agriculture Research Organization, Wakani Center. My name is Moses Kwame Edu. Rhizobium is a useful gram negative soil bacteria that can colonize the legumes roots and symbiotically can fix nitrogen. Rhizobium can form nodules on legume, legumes roots and reduce atmospheric nitrogen to ammonia which can be utilized by its host. Rhizobium can again provide enough nitrogen that can meet the physiological needs of the, of the leguminous plants. It is it is important to note that every rhizobium, every leguminous species do have an effective and a specific rhizobium group that can establish effective nodal fixing nitrogen on its roots. Inoculation is the process of introducing the, the isolate or the rhizobium into the leguminous plants to, to make sure that the plants will, will get enough uh, rhizobium to colonize the root system so as to prevent re-inoculation during the later stages of the plant. Rhizobium strain used for such inoculum should be able to survive in a large quantity as a free living soil bacteria. A better fixing uh, <coughs> nitrogen can be achieved when a superior and effective rhizobium is used for the, ino in the inoculum. There's a whole lot of factors that affect the rhizobium inoculation and then the quantity of nitrogen that it's faced. And among these factors is diverse agro agroclimatic conditions, cropping system, and co <coughs> cultivation practices parameters. The most common mechanism of infection is through the root hairs. And what happened is that as soon as the rhizobium penetrate the, the, the root hairs, the point of infection stops growing and then it begins to kill forming nodules. This diagram summarizes the penetration of the, of, the, of the rhizobium into the root system of the chickpea. This is a chickpea seedling and this is the root being infected with the rhizobium. And what happened is that as soon as it affects the the root hair, the root hair stop growing and then begin to curl in, forming the, uh, uh, the nodules. And then the uh, infection thread begins to form. And this infection thread grows towards the, the cortex of the root. And once the, 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 the thread is infested, it carries the bacteria into the cortex of the root, ensuring that the fixing of uh, uh, nitrogen is, is becomes effective. Chickpea is a leguminous plant and is scientifically known as Cicer aretinum, and it has a plant height of 20 to 50 centimeters. It has a small feathery leaves on the both sides on the both side side of the stem. It has a, a seed pod containing two or three seeds. It's it also has a white uh, flowers with blue veins. 
for optimum growth and yield in both tropical and subtropical, chickpea needs more than uh, 400 millimeters of annual rainfall, and these should be well distributed. In fact, chickpea is a very, very important crop in the Mediterranean area, and then in the, in the in world, it is, it is ranked as a third most important crop. A lot of food can be prepared from chickpea, and it contains 25.3 to 28.9% of protein. Among the food that can be prepared from chickpea are hummus, snacks, soup, sweets and condiments, and also sp sprouted seeds and fresh seeds can also be eaten as vegetables. When the two to come together, when the chickpea being the leguminous plant and the rhizobium come together, symbiosis are formed. And what is happening is that it leads to the formation of uh, root nodules that can face nitrogen and later convert it into ammonia, ammonia. And this ammonia is subsequently also converted to amino acid, which form the building block of the, which is the building block of the, of, of protein. The energy that is needed to drive the energy fixing processes is carbohydrate. And this carbohydrate is produced in the shoot of the chickpea through the process of photosynthesis. And after that, the carbohydrate is, is translocated back into the, to the root, root nodules and used as an energy to drive the, the nitrogen-fixing enzyme, enzyme nitrogenase. This en enzyme, that is nitrogenase, is very sensitive or is extremely sensitive to a high temperature of uh, a high oxygen concentration and it can be deactivated or stop functioning. And this can, can activate again by reducing the high levels of oxygen in the root nodules. And this lowering of the high levels of oxygen in the nodules can be achieved by the substance called lihomoglobin. The diagram here shows how nitrogen is freezed. This is a root no nodule. It contains millions and billions of rhizobium, rhizobium cells <coughs> that fixes nitrogen. So what it does is that it uses sugars that is produced from the shoot of the, of the leguminous plant or the chickpea as an energy and in return fix nitrogen and can then convert it to ammonia and then amino acid that can be used by the plant for its development. So it's like give and take. Objective. The objective of this study is to select and test for the most effective chickpea rhizobium that's available in, in Israel, Israeli rhizobium collection. And to help us to achieve this main objective, a two specific objective was set. The first one is to determine the contribution of each isolate on, 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 on the chickpea rhizobium. And the second one is to determine the rate of which each rhizobium contributes to the formation of uh, root nodules. This research was conducted in the laboratory and in the greenhouse at the Agricultural Research Organization, Department of Agronomy and Natural Resources, the Volcanic Center. Eight strains of rhizobium was also collected from the same institution and tested in this study. And then a chickpea, a local variety called the Havet, which, which was healthy high vigor and free from foreign materials was also used to test the effectiveness of the isolate. Each extra monitor brought an agar was used to grow the bacteria. And then in the laboratory experiments, the isolate or the bacteria were, was grown initially in 250 flux containing 50 ml YEM brought media and later incubated it at 28 degrees Celsius on a rotary shaker. And later, this medium was used to inoculate other medium and a dilution of rhizobium cells with a sterilized tap water containing 10 is to 1 up to 10 is to 8 microliter cells <coughs> of the rhizobium were grown on the YEM agar at 28 degrees Celsius in incubator. 
And then later, the, the isolates was taken into a, a greenhouse to check for its effectiveness. And in the greenhouse, the experiment was divided into two. The first one was replicated at 10 times and we sampled twice. We sampled twice to check for the chickpea contribution to the growth of the, of the, of the, of the, of the chickpea. And then experiment two, it was replicated 20 times and it was sampled at four times to also check for nodal formation. Randomized complete block design was the experimental design used for this experiment. And then the experiment was laid on a, a, a wire mesh benches to prevent contamination, cross-contamination of the, uh, of the isolate. And then the port was also well spaced out to prevent the touching of the, of the, of the plant for the, same, for the same reason. And you can see that the base of the plant is covered with a sterile perlite to also prevent the stubborn isolate from jumping from one pot into the other, if it's possible. Four seeds were sown in each 3-liter pot and one ml suspension of rhizobium isolate containing 10 raised power salts, 10 raised power 7 salts was inoculated to, uh, to each seed. And then later, two healthy plants per pot were retained. And uh, were retained after the formation of the first trial, triforia leaf. Plant height, number of nodules, nodal dry weight, shoot dry weight, root dry weight, single dry weight of nodules were the parameters that was measured in this study. And a statistical software, JAMP9, was used to analyze the data. In the laboratory, we check for the growth of the, of the isolate. You can see that isolate 2, 5, and then 8 have a similar trend, especially in 42, 42 and 68 hours. But isolate 5 continue to grow at 140 hours and isolate two and eight, the growth reduced at 140 hours. Isolate one and isolate seven also have th the same trend. At 42 hours, the growth was very slow, and then the growth picked up at 68 hours, and then declined at 140 hours. Of course, you can see that the decline of this is higher than the decline of isolate, isolate one. And uh, isolate three growth for, uh, at 42 hours was very slow. It picked up in 68 hours and continued to grow at 140 hours. And isolate four was very slow in growing at 42 hours. Growth picked up at 68 hours and it sharply dropped at 140 hours. And isolate six, the growth of 42 and then 120 hours is similar, but the growth of 68 is very, is very low. And this was attributed to the fact that it may be due to a sampling error or some condition which was not favorable, favoring the growth of the isolate. I must say that I must apologize for not having the error bars. This is a, a, the kind of an experiment that only one sampling was, was, was done in these hours. And the greenhouse, this picture was taken in the greenhouse, and it shows a chickpea plant that is inoculated, inoculated with the isolate, and the chickpea plant that is not uh, inoculated with the isolate. And here we can see that the root is very dense, full of uh, nodules, the shoot is big, and then the stem is long relative to the uninoculated one, which is A, which have a, 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 a small roots, and you can hardly see a root nodal here, and it have a short stem, and then the shoot is also uh, small compared to the B, which is the inoculated uh, one. In the greenhouse for the first experiment, the sampling was done twice, like I said, and then the, the first one was done at the vegetative stage, 
and the isolate contribution to the parameters checked was was so amazing. At at plant height, it shows significant. All the co the control shows significant difference to 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 the all the isolate shows a significant difference to the control, and then statistically there is no difference among the isolates, but isolates but isolate cells contribute to the high growth of the plants or high plant height, followed by isolate three. And you can also see that all the isolates contributed more than 30 to the, to the, to the uh, plant height, except isolate, isolate one. And then shoot dry weight, it also shows significance among the isolates and then control. Isolate source, again, was the highest, followed by the isolate seven, and then isolate eight. And then the root dry weight, it also shows significance among the control and then the isolate. <coughs> isolate source continue to lead, and then isolate eight, which is also similar statistically to the first one, which is isolate source. And then nodal, number of nodules show a high significance among the, among the isolates and, and then the control. Statistically, as you can see, the, among the isolates, they are all the same. But isolate one contributed the highest, followed by isolate five, and then isolate four. But like I said, they are all similar statistically. And then nodal no dry weight, it also shows a high significance among the isolates and then the control. And then isolate one and then isolate seven was, was the leading uh, contributor to the nodal uh, dry weight. But again, there's no significant difference among the isolates. And then single, uh, <coughs> single nodal dry weight also isolates cells give a higher weight followed by the nodal. One thing we observed that though the, the, the number of nodules developed by the control was, was, was few, but we observed that it was big. That's why it it's have uh, this kind of weight, especially when you compare it to uh, isolate, five and isolate, isolate three. The plant height continued to grow at a 80% flowering stage. And there again, it shows the highest significance among the, among the isolate and then the control. And then the isolate source continued to lead, followed by isolate five and then isolate three. There again, there's no significant difference between the isolates. And then shoot also shows significance within the isolate and then the, the control. Isolate cells gave the highest contribution to the shoots, followed by isolate eight, and then isolate three. And then root dry weight at the 80% flower and also shows significant difference within the isolate and then the control. Isolate source gave 80.2, which is uh, different from, which is different from say isolate seven and isolate three, but similar to isolate eight statistically. And then number of nodules also continues to increase. And it shows highly significance within the isolates and then, and then control. Isolate eight gives the highest, followed by isolate five, and the third highest was isolate one. And of course, statistically, they are the same, they are no different. And then nodal dry weight also show a highly significance um, to, to the control. Isolate six gave the highest, contributed to the highest uh, value to the Nodal dry weight followed by isolate eight and then isolate 
three. And then noodle dry weight, like I said, the noodles were so big, but it was few. And then the, the, the control and then isolate source has the higher weight in the single noodle. And in the second greenhouse experiment, where um, formation of noodles was tested, we observed that the development of noodles have the same trends. So we sampled, we repeated it at 20, like I earlier said, and we sampled it at, uh, at four times in these times, four weeks after planting, six weeks after planting, eight weeks after planting, and 10 weeks after planting. And you can observe that isolate one, four, five, seven, and, and, and eight have a, a, a same trend of nodal formation. It increases from four weeks after planting and then hits its peak at eight weeks after planting and begins to decline at 10 weeks after planting. But isolate, isolate two, three, and the source continue to, to increase in the no nodal formation at the later, at, at 10 weeks uh, after planting. That's the later development stages of the chick, 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 chickpeas. And you can also observe that in isolate three, at six weeks after planting, the nodal formation was reduced. And this was uh, attributed to the high temperatures in the greenhouse at the time of uh, conducting these experiments. And then you can also observe that in the control, as at four weeks after planting, there, there wasn't any nodal formed. But all the, uh, all the isolates, there's a nodal form as at uh, four weeks after planting. Though we recorded a lower amount at two and then six and then seven uh, isolates. In summary, the isolates was classified into slow and fast growing. And then the fast growing isolates had a similar trend like I've already shown. And then it's, it's multiplied and formed more single colonies with abundant uh, extracellular polysaccharide on the y YEM agar five to seven days. And then the fast growing isolate formed nodules during the early part of uh, the chickpea plant development. All the parameters used to assess the growth and then development and then microbial colonization has a higher value. The plant height, of course, uh, show a significant in increase by, by the contribution of the isolate. And then the dry weight of the shoot was also influenced by the activities of the isolate. And then the lowest dry weight of the shoot was recorded by the non-inoculated uh, control chickpeas, as I showed you. And then the dry weight of the chickpea roots inoculated with the rhizobium isolate was significantly different from the non-inoculated uh, chickpea. All the isolate produce higher nodal dry weight compared to the non-inoculated chickpea. The chickpea inoculated with isolate significantly contributed to the nodal formation and development. The nodal formation followed the same trend and begins to decline at the later stages of the plant. And the results, these results are the indication that inoculated chickpea with some isolate continue to contribute to the formation of, uh, of, uh, of nodules, whilst others do not. Do, uh, do not. In conclusion, isolate one, three, four, and eight, isolate one, three, four, eight, and six were classified as the most effective isolates, and isolate two, five, and seven were classified as the less effective isolate. And then the difference between the two was estimated to be the 30%. And then uh, we recommend in future that the most effective isolate should should be investigated more in the first situation to evaluate its uh, e effectiveness in the hardship of the environment. Thank you. Thank you, Moses. Uh, one question that I was 
not sure about, maybe I didn't understand. In, in the previous slides, you have uh, presented the isolate 6 as having, uh, uh, as inducing uh, enhanced growth and, and uh, yeah. more nodules, etc. However, here, yeah. in the number of nodules, you show as if it is like the control. Yeah. It's true. You are perfectly uh, correct. That's why, if, if you can observe the, the conclusion, look at the way I put the conclusion. I said isolate one, three, four, eight, and six, which means there's a question mark there. Because <laughs> in the normal circumstances, it should have been one, three, four, and six. But chickpea is a cold season uh, plant, and we have only one season to carry out this experiment. And of course, you know, you know, I have been fighting with you and uh, Nina all the time. <laughs> and then there's no way we can leave this we can wait for next year. By then, the whole exercise would have passed. Though still, we have to do it. So we decided to go to the greenhouse with the with the refrigerator, but we, we, uh, with the air conditioning. But we observed that there wasn't enough uh, sun uh, light. There wasn't enough light to to help the plants to to, to, to for us to get the the benefit. Of. So we were forced to do it under the hardship condition. The temperatures was very very high. We tried putting fans, including standing fans, to reduce the temperature, but we, we couldn't uh, uh, successful. But in, in, in order to help us to show the trend of uh, its development, we still went ahead to... to also, to this do. slide is from a second experiment? It's this is from the second experiment where right. the formation of the isolate was estimated. All right. Well, first of all, uh, it was a very nice lecture, and I think the project went very well. And I still uh, assume based on the two uh, numeric um, uh, tables that you had, that number six made the best results that you had. So I would, I would actually, in that respect, uh, take the results about the number of nodules that you have here uh, with less significance than the actual tables. If you come back to the table, okay, uh, or the, and, and look at number six here, no doubt that Wherever you have the uh, the milligram per nodule, okay, the last uh, the last uh, row, and uh, wherever you have the weight of the shoot and the weight of the root, I mean the results are very clear that uh, that number six does it. And take the the previous uh, take the previous uh, 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 table uh, where you have the even even higher. Uh, do you have the previous table? Yeah. Yeah, and you have a seven milligram per nodule, yeah. and you have an enormous uh, uh, evident increase in, in shoot and in, in root for number six. So yeah. I think that these results are more important, aren't they? And this, this I must say that this, this was carried out at the right season of the, of the plant. Yeah. Now, uh, let me ask you something even a little bit more uh, uh, sophisticated. The group in uh, in uh, in Bedagan, not under Kapulnik, but the previous uh, boss, who was one of the founders of nitrogen fixation uh, inoculation experiments in Israel, did actually uh, uh, run chickpea inoculation in a way that the seeds have been inoculated with the bacteria before their introduction into the uh, into the soil. What would you say about about uh, uh, such an approach for chickpea? Yeah, such, a, such an approach will be very laudable, I must say. Because, uh, li like we can see, the chickpea really contributed to the, to the, the development and then the growth of the, of the, of the, of the, uh, of, of the, the isolate contributed to development and the growth of the chickpea, which of course is a clear indication that we are going to get a good harvest from the plants. So one of the, uh, the things we proposed that we, we even wanted to carry out because of time and then the weather didn't allow us is to even coat the bacteria on the, on the, on the, on the, on the chickpea and then later evaluate how we are going to get the, uh, to, to evaluate this uh, growth parameters. And last so question, when you go back home, uh, what would be the significance of whatever you have studied and, and summarized here for any future 
developments back in, uh, in Ghana? I must say this is very practical. It's very practical and anybody can really get his hands on in putting it into practice. So when I go back home, I, I just have to uh, affiliate myself with a, a research institution or uh, agriculture uh, organization and see how this can be uh, practiced. Uh, we have, we see some differences, for example, in the plant height, yeah. for example, in the, in the five and the six. However, however, one plant, it's higher, the six is higher than the, f the, the five. Yeah. In the number of nodules, it is less. So, do you mean that the number of nodules doesn't, uh, like, affect that much the the growth as just the resovium development, or what is what it most affects the development of the plant? The number of nodules, the nodules really affects the development of the plant because the more the nodules, it's assumed that the more the nitrogen fixation. But I've, I also have to point out that we can not just count the nodules and also say that it's, it's active, it's, the nodules is, is positive, or it's, it's active, it is acting or it's active. Sometimes it can be there and it can be inactive. Yeah, so if it's inactive, then its contribution to the growth of the development is also questionable. I have a question related to the soils. What would be the differences, like the main differences between the soils for the, in the, for the fixation and the symbiosis to occur? between the, the resovium and the legumes? Does it work the same for all the type of soil, for example? No, it doesn't, it doesn't work the same in all, all, all type of the soil. I show that the, uh, we have a lot of factors that affect these. Uh, mm. And then you can even see that at my second experiment, the hardship of the weather, the abiotic factors, really affect the contribution of the, of the isolate into the growth of, of, the, of the plants. So soil will be different uh, factors, different soil nutrients also have different uh, 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 influences on the, on, the, on the contribution of the isolate. Mm -hmm. And I, I, must, I must also say that even the, the, the type of the, co the, the variety of the chickpea that you use mm -hmm. also contributes into the, into the, um, the fixation of uh, of the nitrogen by this isolate. Supposing I use seed which is, which is less vigor, definitely it's going to affect even germination. Mm -hmm. And then it cannot grow to facilitate the, the nitrogen fixation of it. So do you expect that uh, the cultivar and the, and the type of soil will interact with the, with the different uh, rhizombium uh, isolates? Definitely. Namely that for each type of soil, you have to test and, and find the, the optimum uh, isolate to be used for it? Yes. Do I have one question? Right. What was the variety of chickpea you used? Um, I used a local variety called uh, the Havit. It's, is it, is, it is commercially adopted. Is that commercially in grown in Israel? Yeah. The most dominant one? Yeah. It's and good. what about other hybrid varieties or other varieties used? Other varieties, if it is accepted as a variety, if it is good, then it can also be used. Because like I said, it's the, the, the type of cultivar have a, a, a major role in, 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 the, in the fixing of the nitro, uh, nitrogen. So if a particular uh, a variety is certified by the seed company, that is good. Okay, now my question so is, if you, you had used some other varieties, then your result would have been same? It depends. If that that have a higher vigor than what I use, the result is not going to be the same. I will anticipate a higher result than this because so I show that a uh, tick pea height have a range of 20 to 50, but none of the of the of, of my results hit 50. So which means if I use a, a, a seed which have a higher vigor, then I'm likely to hit 50 or probably a seed. So for each variety, the isolates, the number of isolates, it might be different for 
the variety you use it's like one three four eight and six F if you use other varieties then other isolates might be effective yeah it's not it's effective it's it is uh, here it is you looking at the contribution that's why i have the control right and look at control here there's no isolate there, no, there's, there's nothing yeah. it's about it how it it will contribute into its development that's what you, you, you we are looking at Okay, thank you. I have a small questions about the numbers, means isolate six, and yeah. there, when there is a low number of, uh, less number of nodules, you found uh, root dry weight less, and the root dry weight higher. Is there any relationship between the ro effect of rhizobia in the suit and root formation? Effect of rhizobium and the suit dry weight and root dry weight, it means? Yeah, yeah, yeah there, there is. There is because, uh, you know, one thing happened. We observe one thing. When it forms uh, more nodules, after picking the nodules from the roots, then the roots becomes uh, lighter, right? Because we have to, we have to again remember that it's the root hairs that forms the nodules. Right, so when it forms a lot of nodules and you take it out, the root becomes lighter. And we also have to uh, bear in mind that the plants have to feed the rhizobium and also have to feed the have to feed the uh, the root with the same starch, right? So it's like doing two things at the same time. It's it's not. It's not. It's it's it's, it's not a dry bag. It's it's, it's 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 a beneficial thing. But I'm telling you that it's the same root that curl the root cells that curl to form the form the, uh, uh, the the root nodules. So supposing the plant is actively forming root nodules, and then I harvest or I sample, I'm likely to to get the. Okay. Thank you. I want to ask a question. Yeah. Is there any possibility of utilizing such bacterial inoculation in uh, cereal crops also, or only in leguminous crops? And what makes it different to adapt in cereal to uh, symbi make symbiosis in, in uh, legume and not in cereal crops? All right. Uh, this, this, this bacteria is noted of uh, fixing a uh, colonizing the roots of a, a leguminous plant. And then even in the leguminous plants, we have every leguminous plant have, have its specific uh, 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 bacteria that can colonize the, the roots of the rice as well. But what we can do to help in the cereal production is that after planting days, the, in the literature, it is, it is stated that after rhizobium has been uh, um, used on the food and after harvesting it's it's sort of leave the nitrogen the nitrogen it improves the soil uh, uh, nutrition so any plant subsequent plants that you grow there is likely to pick up the these uh, uh, nutrients so so after we've cut out or we harvest our 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 leguminous plants or the chickpea we can grow uh, syrup cereals which of course is again is going to help uh, increase the yield. Okay. Up there? When rhizobium oh. infects the root, does it interfere with the growth of the root hairs or not? It's it's, it's it interferes with the growth of the root hairs. In what way? It what is stops so is that what happened is that when it's affected it stopped growing. The point of infection stopped growing. And then as soon as it stopped growing, it starts to curl to form the nodule. So it will curl, uh. and then the bacteria will be inside. And then the root thread will develop. And this root thread will pull the bacteria into the root cortex. Root cortex. And this ensures a very positive symbiosis. That is, it, uh, it really enhances the nitrogen fixation. Thank you.
Last question, Hafte. Uh, I haven't seen the media you used to in the greenhouse. Maybe in most cases, uh, sterile media is used to evaluate such type of experiment. Yeah. Potting soil or some some kind of uh, potting material used for your experiment, yeah. and also. Um, their effectiveness also depends on the carbon to nitrogen ratio of uh, the media. Maybe you have to consider that one also. But in most, uh all right, the media used was uh, was sun. It was sun. It's the sun was uh, w it was sterilized. It was dried. a solar sterilization. That's the media that is used in, in the in the in the in the growth of the of the year. And then to avoid uh, cross contamination, a pellet was just used to cover the the pot to prevent the bacteria which are likely to jump from doing that. Okay, thank you very much Moses. Yeah. Okay, we shall move on to our uh, next presentation. Uh, the next presenter will be uh, Zarai Mari Haile. Um, uh, Zarai is from Ethiopia. He had his uh, BSc studies in plant science from uh, Alamaya University uh, in uh, 2003. And since then, he was working as a researcher uh, at the Ethiopian Institute of Agricultural Research at the Werer Center, um, focusing in uh, crop protection. And uh, since last year, he is a master's student in uh, our program. Zarai, please. Thank you, Shuki. Uh, good morning, everybody. My title is Seed Germination and Early Development of Tomato Integration Lines under Salinity. Uh, it was conducted under the supervision of uh, Professor Saranga. <coughs> uh, to begin with the introduction, uh, I will start with the effect of salinity on plants. As we all know, uh, salinity is a anabiotic stress. Uh, it affects the growth and uh, productivity of plants. Wow. Uh, one of its effects is uh, osmotic, uh, it's low external water potential uh, that will cause uh, stomatal closure, which will, uh, which will reduce the concentration of car carbon dioxide inside the cell uh, that, will, that will lead to pho for photo reduction that will result in accumulation of uh, reactive oxygen species causing uh, oxidative stress. The other effect is uh, it makes certain ions unavailable for being uptaken by the plant, like potassium, that is competition for uptake because they have uh, uniform, uh, I mean similar uh, ion, radiation, ion radius with uh, Sodium, it also makes unavailable calcium and at severe cases, uh, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus. The other effect due to the accumulation of uh, sodium and chlorine, uh, toxicity may be there in plants. Uh, sodium can accumulate to a toxicity level that it will interfere with ions, uh, I mean some enzymatic activities and also uh, disrupt us. Uh, Membrane, uh, membrane fluidity. The chlorine toxicity is scorching effect. It burns the leaves. Okay. Uh, all in all, uh, it reduces uh, the performance of plants. 
lateral shoot growth will be affected and premature flowering will be there. Uh, this is in general uh, how salinity affects the plant. But the thing is, where is this salinization problem is where is focusing. I mean, we all know that we are living in a planet where three-fourths of the ecosystem is uh, saline. But it's obvious that we are not depending for productivity of our crops in these three-fourths of uh, the saline ecosystem. But we are mainly depending in the unsaline part. And that is our issue. I, that part of uh, productive sources that are increasingly affected by uh, salinity problem. Wow. Of course, the, the effect is mainly concentrated in arid and semi-arid region of the, uh, of our planet. That is this, the orange color of, in this, uh, of this map shows you the arid and semi-arid region, uh, arid and semi-arid regions in the in our in our planet it's found in northern central america uh, in southern in africa europe and asia also in uh, australia in these regions the land use system which is majorly affected by salinization is the agricultural land uh, at the same time this region has aquifers which have more saline than the rest of the world. Uh, but why is this happening? I mean, naturally, of course, we have three-fourths of our ecosystem is saline, but the secondary salinization is affecting the rest part. That is because this area is experiencing low precipitation throughout the year. That means the salinity in the root zone cannot be leached down. The next one is high surface evaporation. The area is experiencing high temperature, so uh, along with the evaporating water, salt can be come to the surface. The other is weathering of uh, native rocks in the area due to the uh, climatic factors. And of course, our contribution to poor cultural practices and forest clearance that affects the the physical and chemical property of the soils, which increases uh, its, suscepti its susceptibility to salinity. On top of that, as I mentioned earlier, we the aquifers in this area are more saline, and they are also the source of our irrigation. So this adds uh, the salinization problem to be uh, severe. These are the list of countries which use uh, saline irrigation in the world, including uh, Ethiopia uh, and Israel. In addition to this, the one, there is one anticipation that about 50% of the arable lands will be saline by uh, 2050. That means almost we'll be losing the product, our productive lands to salinity. In this area, actually, uh, many crops are grown, of which uh, tomato is one and most economical. That is one reason to consider in the, uh, to salinity in tomato. The other one, tomato is becoming uh, a model crop nowadays for uh, quantitative trades. Uh, we will see the reason in a minute. Okay, to start with tomato, it's naturally perennial but cultivated as annual. Uh, Tropical plant domesticated in South and Central America. Currently is cultivated in a range of climatic conditions, including in the Arctic circles. Uh, actually, high productivity of this crop is realized in areas having warm climates in, in the Mediterranean region, southern and western part of the US and Mexico. The leading producer is China, followed by uh, US. Previously, we saw uh, the effect of salinity on crop. Now we'll see uh, specifically to tomato in brief. Uh, when we characterize most of our cultivated tomato varieties, they are sensitive to moderately sensitive to salinity. Salinity affects us actually uh, tomato from germination to uh, 
yield reduction. Uh, it can cause 70 percent adi uh, delay, additional days to, for tomato seeds to germinate at 100 millimolar sodium chloride salinity, or even 125 percent more days at 150 millimolar salinity than if we use uh, uh, medium without salt. It also slows down the uh, shoot growth and of younger seedlings. Uh, as compared to freshwater irrigation, uh, we can lose 50% of our yield if we use uh, saline water of about 100 millimolar uh, so, uh, sal salinity concentration. In general, seedlings are more se sensitive to salinity than matured planters in a way that a concentration that can kill seedling I mean, a concentration that can kill seedling can be tolerated by much root plant. That is why uh, our focus is on seedling germination and early growth, because if we have varieties having good uh, tolerance at seedling level, then we can guarantee that their productivity will be maintained at the end. Yeah, previously I mentioned that tomato is becoming a model crop to study quantitative traits, including uh, uh, salinity and the reasons are of its family it's one of the most studied one so we have a wealth of knowledge about the genetics and physiology of it on top of that it can be successfully be crossed with uh, its most wild relatives and give rise uh, fertile progenies this helps us to have uh, to reach itself with quetails conferring for different type of uh, various stresses on top of that, there are also many inter interspecific segregating populations in tomato uh, that are very important for uh, quantitative trait studies. For example, we have salt sensitive cultivated tomato and salt tolerant wild type interspecific segregating populations. In addition to this, we have also integration lines. We will see it, what integration line mean in the next slide about five integration lines so far, and these integration lines hold this, uh, segments of exotic uh, genetic materials in the background of uh, cultivated one. They are very uh, good for uh, quantitative trait studies. To define with integration line, it's a line containing a single integration from wild tomato genome produced by successive backgrounds in the domesticated background. Uh, how it's done is, here presented sch schematically, uh, we cross elite varieties with wild, and then back cross with the uh, elite variety again. Then we will, using the marker assisted selection and uh, consecutive back crosses, uh, we will end up uh, with such lines. And this, these lines, say for example, if we take integration line one one, it has this segment from the wild type, but the rest from elite and if we compare for any kind of quantitative trait, this one with it is uh, elite, and if we, uh, from its parent, and if we found that some difference, then that difference is attributed due to this segment. That is why it's very uh, good. Uh, m I mean, good, good, good lines to to deal with uh, uh, quantitative traits. I told you that there are five integration lines so far, uh, among which this is the one integration library we used for this uh, experiment. Uh, it composes uh, Solana and Penile accession, this one in the background of uh, a cultivated tomato cultivar M82. Uh, this is the most study uh, IL library for most of the quantitative traits, including uh, uh, sal salinity stress actually. Uh, we are selecting this one. One is available in our lab, and the other, uh, the donor one, is uh, salt, salt tolerant. Uh, with this background, the objective of this study was uh, to assess the effect of salinity on germination and seedling development, and to identify the genomic regions conferring salt tolerance at emergence and early development. As the material method, uh, we use 76 integration lines along with their parental cultivar. 
20 seats were selected and germinated in petri dish uh, with two salinity levels. One is zero, having uh, only three millimolar calcium chloride, and the other is extra 120 millimolar sodium chloride. We actually reached to, uh, we selected this con concentration based on our preliminary study. We conducted preliminary study on four cultivated varieties and produce a germination curve. Of that germination curve, we were interested on a point where 50% of the germination was reduced. And based on that, we, we selected this one as uh, a treatment. Why 50%? One thing, we, don't, we need the seedlings to evaluate after they, they germinate. And uh, I mean, we need the seedlings, so we don't need to kill all of them by heavy stress. And, and also, having 50% uh, uh, a level which kills 50% that gives you uh, to identify those performs well. I mean, they can, they, can, they can express themselves well in this condition. So those express, express themselves well can be, uh, uh, can be good to study for further uh, salinity studies. Ten uniformly germinated slingers uh, were then transferred to uh, pots filled with coarse quartz sand. They were germ uh, irrigated daily with hogland solution, having a 120 millimolar sodium chloride uh, concentration, and without that. The experiment were, was actually uh, conducted in gross room, having uh, this uh, Humidity 70%, 25%, uh, 25 degrees centigrade temperature, and 11 light hours. The experiment was laid in factorial design. Uh, seedlings were uprooted 20 days after transferring for leaf number count, shoot, and root lengths measurements. Uh, shoot and roots were oven dried for 72 hours over at 60 degrees centigrade. We also did mineral analysis on sodium, chlorine, and uh, uh, potassium. For this, actually, we didn't use all of the lines because it's time taking, and we selected 15 best performing lines to analyze for it. Uh, in order to extract the solution, we used uh, 0 0.01 normality nitric acid. And it was shaken for three hours by shaker, then centrifuged for 10 minutes, and we used a uh, flame photometer for sodium and uh, chlorine analysis, sodium and potassium, and chloride analyzer for uh, chlorine analysis. Of course, we used standard solution to calibrate the standard curve and have uh, and to calculate the uh, the amount of ions in the sample we used. Result and discussion. Actually, salt stress affected negatively almost all of the growth parameters we considered. Uh, this is the, fir okay, the first result. Uh, germination percentage and time to 50% germination. This table shows you time to 50% germination. The yellow highlighted ones are those who have Take those which takes less time to germinate 50 percent than the M82, and those with green highlight that takes longer time than the uh, control. As as you can see, these lines have shorter time to germinate to f to germinate for 50 percent than the M82. This is speed of time actually very important at field condition even because. If you use saline water or even on saline land, there is a crust forming problem. And these are, the, when seeds germinate sooner, then they can bypass the crust formation case. So the stand establishment will be well there. The naked stylus one are those who performed well at relative. Wh when I say relative, their performance under treatment as compared to their performance under control. Uh, this one is the germination percentage under, con under control condition, A, and treatment, and uh, relative term. 
under control uh, three of three lines by the way zero uh, this line the zero lines shows you the perform the performance the performance of m82 we bring the performance of m82 as zero i mean we centered every performance toward the performance of m82 then the m82 becomes centered to zero and every deviation from that is if it is negative then uh, lower performance if it is in the positive uh, axis it is uh, higher performance than the m82 and under control condition only three of lines have lower germination percentage than the rest whereas at treatment uh, IL-64, 14 and 72, 925, 741, 913 got significantly higher percentage, germination percentage than the control in, in, uh, uh, in relative term in addition to this 925 and 83 has got uh, significant uh, uh, germination than the the control these are their performance or significantly lower than the control IL-14647274192593 they have significantly better per, uh, germination at salinity and as well as they germinate earlier their 50% germination was earlier than the control under salinity condition. This is the leaf number. Uh, as you can see, some of the lines has got lower leaf number even under control, and some of the lines have got higher leaf number under salinity treatments. This are the lines which have got a higher leaf number than uh, M82 under salinity treatment. This is the yellow circle is about 913. This is so far is superior. I mean. It got higher performance in germination in early germina in time to germinate, and in uh, you know also in the leaf number. Having high leaf number can guarantee you have uh, a high photosynthetic efficiency, of course. And the other parameter we looked for was uh, shoot lengths. Uh, in shoot lengths, it's only one IL eleven two had higher uh, shoot lengths than the control at treatment and when we consider the relative performance 13 IL 13 831 83 741 5144 14 and 112 had uh, higher performance than the uh, M82 relative to nano stress condition these lines had perform good than M82 and the underlying one has good performance at germination as well as at uh, time to germinate. 913 is still is, is, is having a uh, higher performance in every uh, parameters we saw so far. Uh, for root lingers is only uh, IL-1211 got higher uh, root lingers than the M82 at treatment, then at relative term. Actually, salinity slows down root growth. It's only 1211 root was significantly longer than uh, M82. Under stress condition is expected, for, uh, especially at for normal uh, for uh, tomato plant. Uh, the other parameter we looked at were uh, shoot dry and root dry mass uh, for. IL-44 and IL-112 has higher shoot dry mass at treatment level and IL-813 at relative term its shoot dry mass was higher than M82. When you come to the root dry mass, uh, IL-112 and 12-4 had high root dry mass than uh, M82 under uh, stress condition 72 and 831 and 94 in their relative uh, performance the other thing we did was uh, shoot mineral content and I present you here uh, potassium to sodium ratio and chlorine uh, 
in control condition, there wasn't any difference between the lines and the control. Uh, but for chlorine, some of the lines got lower than uh, the M82 under control condition, and one line has higher 11, that is 11.2 has higher than uh, chlorine. This line, it has also higher sodium to potassium potassium to sodium ratio, chlorine, and sodium concentration also. And in the previous, in the previous slides also, it's, it's got uh, higher root dry mass, and shoot dry mass, and higher shoot lengths. By the way, well, sorry, yeah. Having high chlorine content and sodium without reaching their toxicity level can help to, to, to modify the, the osmotic relation. I mean, it ca it, it, there are also osmolites if they are not under toxic uh, concentration. So they will help it to have uh, more solution flow. That may be the reason why this line is performing uh, good, though its, per its percentage of germination performance is very poor. Okay, this is the main part of this study. I mean, the mapping, and based on the performance they showed, we tried to map uh, the ILS. In the first chromosome, chromosome uh, the segment IL14, it has high germination percentage. Uh, by the way, the black one is for control, red is for uh, treatment, and green is for uh, relative term. And the under read and underlined are for both relative and uh, treatment. So IL-14, it has uh, association with increased germination, decreased time to 50% germination, and increased uh, shoot lengths at 50%, uh, uh, at relative term, I mean. Uh, the segment 2-4 is mostly associated with unfavorable uh, 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 traits, reduced shoot lengths, dry mass shoot uh, root lengths, both under control and uh, uh, treatment level. In the third uh, chromosome, uh, we only one segment was associated with decreased root lengths that was also even under control condition, uh, whereas on the fourth one, uh, four four has uh, associations with many of the traits: shoot length, shoot dry mass, shoot lengths, germination percentage, and time reduced time to germination. Uh, for three, it is associated with a uh, leaf number at treatment. Uh, in chromosome five, most of the, uh, the associations were not for favorable uh, uh, traits. But on chromosome six, we have one, six, four. It has good germination percentage, uh, lower uh, time for germination and uh, at treatment level. On chromosome seven, segment seven one for uh, seven four one was associated with uh, reduced time, both at uh, treatment and relative term, and increased shoot lengths and increased germination uh, at relative term. In seven two, increasing germination and leaf number and decreased germination time was associated. Uh, in chromosome eight, segment eight one, it was associated with uh, increased leaf number, uh, increased potassium to sodium ratio, and uh, time to 50% germination. Eight three and eight three one, they were associated. They were, they were found association associated with uh, increased leaf number, shoot lengths, potassium to sodium ratio. Uh, and high germination uh, in their relative. In chromosome nine, segment 913, with for increased leaf number, decreased time for 50% germination, decreased sodium content, increased potassium to sodium ratio, that is in uh, treatment under stress condition and uh, the, uh, this, this uh, traits for uh, relative. On segment 12, uh, 11, I mean, 
uh, 11 2 was associ associated with increased truth laying as a dry mass, root dry mass, sodium and potassium. Uh, sodium and potassium to sodium ratio, increase shoot langers, and increase chlorine at control uh, condition. Uh, in segment, in chromosome 12, uh, in 12-1-1, it was uh, associated with uh, increased root langers under uh, salinity stress. In general, uh, 154 ketels were uh, found associated with different uh, traits. Uh, under control condition, 12 traits were, 12 lo loci were associated to be uh, for, uh, responsible for these uh, traits, for these traits, under unfavora for unfavorable 21. Under salinity stress, uh, 32 ketels were associated with favorable effects under salinity and 34 uh, with an unfavorable uh, condition. Uh, in relative term, 39s were found associated uh, with uh, favorable traits and 16 with uh, unfavorable. In conclusion, uh, germination and sealing development of most of the ILS and MA2 were negatively affected by salinity condition. Uh, out of 154 ketel associated with germination, sealing development, and mineral content, 71 were responsible for favorable effect under salinity and in their relative term. These lines, IL14, 44, 64, 81, 91, and 913, they were superior in germination and for most of gross parameters measured. Uh, for IL2, it has lower uh, percentage germination under salinity condition, but the shoot lingers, shoot and root dry mass, uh, and it has also associated with uh, so high sodium, potassium to sodium ratio. Yeah, QTL identified for having positive response under salinity can be used for uh, further salinity stress. Sorry, this is the reference I used. Thank you. Question, Alicia? Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, I have to leave uh, to ask two questions and, uh, and, and I, I apologize. Uh, the calcium and the sodium chloride combination. Uh, is this aiming the calcium for, uh, for the ions in the calcium chloride uh, as cell line or is it aiming for, uh, for a different uh, purpose? What do you know about the combination of calcium and sodium from studies which have been conducted actually here in Israel, when the calcium concent co when the calcium concentration is good enough, it protects the root. I mean, the selectivity for potassium will be high under good condition of calcium. That is at which uh, at which uh, uh, plant I mean at which crop was the calcium effect uh, uh, actually made very clear, very evident? Uh, can you recall from literature? but maybe tomato? Uh, in cereals, actually. That, that was a very clear uh, effect, uh, like having 10% calcium or 5% calcium ions compared to sodium chloride. And, uh, and Professor Kofkafi, which is in our building in the plant sciences, uh, has become actually the uh, world leader in the understanding of the, of the moderation of, uh, of salinity, uh, severe effects by, by calcium calcium uh, ions. Um, this is number one. Number two, could you, could you tell me why was the calcium uh, included only in the germination and not later on when the plants have been developing? Okay, on the germination, we want to see only the effect of sodium chloride. That is why we added three millimolar of calcium. But later on, the solution we used is Hogland. Calcium is already there. We don't need to add it. The only thing we modify, we need to modify that solution is for its salinity. We added uh, an amount of sodium chloride to make a 120 millimolar uh, watering solution. I see. Yeah. Okay, we have to leave, so I apologize. Thank you, Alicia. Who else for questions, please?
Dafna. Dafna. There, Janak. You mentioned earlier that osmotic effect in introduction leads to ROS accumulation. Yeah. But as far as I know, I have never encountered any literature that suggests that osmotic effect leads to ROS accumulation. What do you say about that? Here you mean? Yes. You said that you, you never come across? Never encountered any experiment in which osmotic stress is implied, <coughs> but the level of ROS was not induced or like this. Just simple logic. Osmotic, one of the effect of salinity is osmotic. Yeah. That leads to stomata, uh, uh, stomatal closure. What stoma stomatal closure will bring in lower concentration of carbon dioxide. There, there is a rubisco. It's active for oxygen and carbon dioxide. When the oxygen concentration is high than carbon dioxide, it will tend to f work with oxygen, right? When it works with oxygen, uh, of course, ROS are always there, but their concentration yes. matters. Yes. When there is no enough CO2 concentration, the production of ROS is, will be higher. It's, uh, no, I mean, I'm not saying that. Before, <laughs> it was considered the logic is okay. Uh -huh. But while doing experiments, <laughs> they did experiments many times because salinity is the main problem. The yeah. experiments are just running everywhere on salinity. <laughs> but when the experiments are being run, then they never encountered ROS accumulation during this stress. So they consider this as a different than, they took it differently somehow. Though it is n it's still questionable, it's not clear, but they just started thinking that it's a little bit different from ROS accumulation. I don't know why, but if you can explain. But not, not, g not being able to identify it doesn't take us to the conclusion that it will not bring, uh, I mean, a rose, but I, c I referred on many literatures and uh, under salinity uh, under salinity stress ROS are also there I've also read on literatures okay but I never <laughs> encountered the condition that the osmotic <laughs> stress induces ROS no no look because the thing is for uh, biotechnology assignment I did on it and uh, I, I, I consulted a lot of literatures and I found that that is it <laughs> Okay, that might be your fun, but even I work on specifically on ROS, and I never encountered the situation that <laughs> the osmotic stress or the salinity stress they itself induces ROS. No, what I mean is, look, not being able to identify it at one or twice of the, I mean, trial, it doesn't take us to the conclusion that it will not, you know? Thanks, please. <laughs> Let us not, not focus on, on this aspect because it's a marginal thing to, to this uh, work. Yeah. Are you told that the seedling does not tolerate the salinity yeah. than the water plants? Uh, what's yes. the physi physiology behind this? Okay. I mean, when you are matured enough, you are enough to tolerate everything, right? Than being <laughs> seedling, that is why. I mean, at seedling stage, they are vulnerable for every kind of stress. I think that is common for every plant, I guess. And that is happening here also in tomato. I mean, when it's seedling, yes, it's vulnerable for every kind of uh, stresses. No, but I was asking about the physiology behind it, yeah. The physiology behind? Yeah, maybe the some osmotic stress. Yeah, I mean, they can't adjust their osmotic st the adjust The capability to adjust their osmotic stress at seedling stage and at later stage is not the same. I mean, at the later stage, just they have a lot of uh, accumulated assimilates, and they can adjust by breaking those hex sources to, 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 to maintain the water flow. But in this case, they are seedlings, so I don't think they have that much accumulations of uh, osmolites to, to counterbalance the effect, the stress, I mean. Okay, one simple question. What's Hogland solution? What's Hogland solution? Yeah. Uh, okay, Hogland solution is a, a solution containing major nutri all nutrients to enable plants to grow without soil. I mean, it will contain every nutrient that enables is plants it to grow. Specific for tomato or it's, it's general. A standard nutrient. Standard nutrient. 
that I, not, not from the scheme, but practically, how do they develop the integration lines? The integration lines? Yeah. Here? Yeah, but not, you didn't develop them, right? H how they actually have to cross them with the lead cultivar that it was, I think, M82? Yes, for us, for our case, the, the elite variety will be M82, mm -hmm. and the wild variety is the, so the Penny Lee, that is okay. actually resistant for uh, salinity stress. Okay. You, you cross them, you back cross the F1 with the M82, mm -hmm. then there will be successive cross back crossing. No, but the part that I don't understand is in the, you have the el elite variety, let's say it's M82, and then you have the other one named that it's pe pe Penny Lee. Okay, so Penny Lee. Penny Lee. So then you have the, the hybrid. Yes, you have the hybrid. Okay, from the hybrids, how do you go to to identify the chromosomes and say, okay, so okay, this for that from you would mark a sister selection. Uh -huh. Then yeah. you you will identify on chromosome number one mm -hmm. at which point the segment is there. I mean, later on you will be having such map. Mm -hmm. Say for example, he, this is chromosome number one. Mm -hmm. At this chromosome number one, this segment is replaced by this one and it is IL-112. You, you, you give have this line only, uh -huh. having the rest, the background of M82. So any difference mm -hmm. that is, you, 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 you observe it will be accounted due to this one because the rest is the same. Okay. You didn't after get after Since I was involved in the history of developing these lines, I can say that after after crossing and producing the Becros 1, Becros 1 was grown, then the progenies, the Becros mm -hmm. 1 F2, Becros 1 F3, etc., were grown for several generations. Then the outcoming lines, after they were somewhat s genetically stabilized, were taken and scanned with genetic markers. Mm -hmm. So based on these genetic markers, lines were selected that have single intro introgression, introgression in different parts of the genome. Now, in some cases where the genome was not covered completely, they had to go back to different lines and find a lines where they had the, these introgressions in order to complete the entire set of ILs that gives a full coverage of the Lycopersicum pinelli uh, genome in, in the uh, esculentum background. One question for you, Jarai. You, you told that in introduction, salinity caused uh, the earlier frowning. How it is physiologically, how it is triggered the earlier frowning in the, uh, in the crops because of salinity? Because of, okay, Bagzeri, early flowering, premature flowering is a response of plant for, every st for many of the stresses. I mean, when they, when they are when they sense that they are under stress, they want to finish their life cycle as soon as possible to give a progeny. I think that is the reason why the prematurity will be there, premature flower. It's premature or earlier flowering? That prematurity is earlier. It's the same, right? <laughs> no, it means physiologically how uh, suppose sodium can trigger the Earlier flowering. Sodium can trigger earlier Suppose flowering. sodium, how it uh, help to trigger the earlier flowering? Sodium can't trigger earlier flowering. That's no, you told that uh, salinity. Sal yes, under when the, when plants are under stress. I mean, when the conditions are not favorable, that is there. They have signals. Many signals are produced due to dust stress, right? That signals may be to close up this life cycle soon. That may be the case uh, to for premature. I mean, earlier uh, flowering and the like. I have a question. Uh, from your conclusion, you said that there is 154 loci that are related to salt stress. Is that the conclusion? Yeah. And um, so, so do you? Is there like a difference contribution to each one of these loci? I mean, if you want to breed for 
uh, salinity for more salinity resistant um, tomato variety. Yeah. So, like, uh, do you, from your experience, do you know which low size you need to aim that you want to include in this? Uh, I mean, I just uh, maybe yeah, you said it, to, but I didn't uh, understand. Look, yeah, every every traits are I mean they are controlled by different locuses. That's why and one trait can can contribute for many tra uh, one locus can contribute for many traits too. Here you can see. Here you can see that for germination percentage, we have uh, three, three lines mm -hmm. that are superior than the MH2. For leaf number six lines, maybe this, uh, yeah. say 913 is responsible, is associated with all these uh, favorable uh, traits under salinity. So if there is any breeding program uh, interested in specific uh, uh, this one would be more interesting to include then. More, o there are more of this one actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they can be. Okay. Uh, my question is, um, the lines were not uh, consistent for uh, germination, uh, and germ dash to germination percentage, and also for some of the lines had superior result for. Uh, germination percentage and days to 50% germination, but uh, in terms of biomass accumulation, other lines, yeah. uh, I think particularly this uh, IL-9-3, it was superior in terms of germination, but uh, it was not superior in biomass accumulation, I think. Yes. So uh, which trait is uh, important to map the QTLs? Uh, germination or biomass accumulation? No, we are mapping the QTLs according to their uh, effect on those traits we observed. I mean, it's not a must for one line to perform everywhere. I mean, in every trait, because every, tra every trait is every trait is differently uh, controlled by uh, different, they are differently controlled by different locuses, right? I mean, a locus which is responsible for high germination under stress cannot be responsible to have high leaf number under stress. Cannot be responsible to have uh, to accumulate high biomass. I mean, it's different. That is why uh, salinity stress are uh, quantitative traits. Stress are quantitative traits. Many traits, many locus involves. I think if I got you. Okay. <laughs> One more question. How many replicates you have? Of your five replicates and in every li uh, you build the QTL mapping no the QTL based is the on last the last the QTL is yeah. based on uh, mm. the this performance i mean the uh, the statistics i showed you on tables and the and the graph this is based on this one say IL64 mm. these lines they have significantly lower time to germinate for fi to reach 50% germination under salinity that means it shows that they have something to do with uh, speed of germination okay thank you did you find some qtl that affects positively in some trait in salinity under salinity stress and negatively in another trait during salinity stress okay important in one yes yeah at the same time, the same time? Uh, well, i mean, I mean contradicting effect, let's say uh, enhancing germination but um, reducing but leaf number. Yes, like this. I think there are, here increase leaf number, decrease shoot length. Okay. There will be, yes, because, the, I mean, there are different traits, different characteristics. They can be affected differently by one locus. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, uh, I want to thank again to all the speakers of this uh, morning session. And we shall uh, go now for uh, a lunch break and resume our presentations at uh, quarter past one.